Hello, welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. I told you last time about a clandestine, worldwide, illicit trade ring. A group of rich merchants and planters in coalition with the dregs of society. Interlopers and smugglers, rum runners and pirates. That coalition stretched from Madagascar to Nassau in the Bahamas, and then up to the British colonies in North America, New York with the likes of Frederick Phillips, and to the Carolina colony. But that last bit, Carolina, I brushed past last time. We haven't talked much about Carolina yet. Massachusetts, New York, Madagascar, we've introduced all of them, but Carolina... Well, it holds kind of a special place in the story of the pirates. In our story, it really hasn't popped up yet. Virginia was more prominent when the buccaneers were roaming the seas. But moving forward, well, Blackbeard, Charles Vane, Steed Bonnet. I mean, at the end of Black Sails, Captain Flint winds up at Savannah. There's a host of sunken pirate ships and buried treasures that grace the Carolina coast. The swamps of Carolina were always there as a kind of last resort for the pirates. So today we're going to talk about Carolina in some depth, really introduce it. From the founding of the colony to the current point in our overall story. This is episode 194, The Rogue's Harbor. There is one person in particular that interests us in Carolina a doctor that we mentioned last time, who was part, an integral part, of that international illegal slave trading ring. He was one part explorer and one part doctor and one part buccaneer. His name was Dr. Henry Woodward. But we can't really talk about the founder of Carolina without discussing how the colony itself came to be. The English had been attempting to colonize the region for decades now. Their first attempt came under Queen Elizabeth in the failed colony at Roanoke. And then a bit later on, King Charles I laid claim to Carolina and gave it its name in 1629. He issued a land grant to Attorney General Robert Heath, but that second attempt to colonize Carolina fizzled out almost as hard as Roanoke did. After the Civil Wars, Oliver Cromwell's western design more or less ignored Carolina. He was focusing instead on Port Royal and Jamaica, the Caribbean in general. But then in 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne. The latter Stuarts had big plans for the Carolinas. Charles II loved the name, after the French version of Charles, and he planned to use Carolina land grants to secure his base of support back in England. Eight of the most powerful nobles that supported his restoration to the throne were named Lord's Proprietor in the 1663 Charter of Carolina. Those eight names are all names that we would recognize, but two in particular stand out. The first of those, well, in fact, the name on the charter is George Monk, the first Duke of Albemarle, but it's really his son Christopher Monk who's much more important. We all should know who Christopher Monk is. He was Henry Morgan's patron in 1672 when Morgan was brought up on charges. He was the most important figure in Jamaican politics for decades. He had significant interests in Virginia and now, in 1663, in Carolina. He's the Duke of Albemarle. Even before the 1663 charter, even before the restoration, Albemarle had interest in Carolina. There were settlers from his land in Virginia that were moving south into what would later come to be called Albemarle Sound. But the Albemarle Sound had another name. They called it the Rogue's Harbor. In part, that's because Albemarle Sound provided an almost infinite number of coves and inlets that ran deep into the countryside. They were perfect places for pirates and smugglers to hide out. The land that surrounded the Sound was largely swampland. That's where a bunch of wild species like the Venus flytrap originate. And before they drained the Carolina swamplands, it was 
nearly unthinkable to settle on most of the coastline. You're not likely to build a house or grow crops there, so no one was going to spot a hidden pirate ship from the landward side. Rogue's Harbor was a fitting name for the colony. The second Lord Proprietor is another figure that we should know. We've met him before, but not in real depth. His name was Edward Hyde, 1st Earl of Clarendon, and Hyde was a major figure in English politics. I could recite his list of titles and positions held, but these episodes can only be so long, so instead of that, I'll point out that Edward Hyde's daughter, Anne Hyde, married the future King James II. Both Queen Mary II and Queen Anne were his granddaughters. The Duke of Albemarle and Earl of Clarendon were both staunch supporters of the Stuarts. That's how they got included on the Charter. But personally, they were at odds with one another. There wasn't, like, a, you know, a super passionate hatred between the two, but they were rivals professionally. Now, the Carolina Charter granted the Lord's Proprietor land that stretched from the 36th parallel north to the 31st parallel north. Those are latitudinal lines that stretched, in the eyes of England, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The 36th parallel is a bit south of the modern border between Virginia and North Carolina. It wasn't exactly in the same spot, but that would sort itself out later on. The 31st parallel is more interesting, though. It equates roughly to the modern border between Georgia and Florida. That is a not insignificant amount of land, even ignoring the impossibility that it would ever stretch to the Pacific Ocean, that's three modern states' worth of territory. But that was by design, as there were several Lords Proprietor named in the Charter. Almost immediately, Carolina began to be divvied up between two sides among the Lords Proprietor. To the north, there was the Albemarle Province, sometimes even then called Northern or North Carolina. To the south, there was the Clarendon province, sometimes called Southern or South Carolina. Now, officially, they would remain a single political entity until 1712, when North and South Carolina would split, and then in 1732, Georgia would split off. But the differences between the Albemarle and Clarendon provinces were apparent to everyone immediately pirates as much as anyone. To put it very broadly, from the purview of the pirates, North Carolina was just way cooler than South Carolina. For a number of reasons, mainly it was their far superior barbecue. But really, what I mean here is that North Carolina was a lot more lenient toward illegal and semi-legal activity. Pirates, smuggling, that kind of thing. I mean, what kind of a monster uses mustard as a barbecue sauce base? No, stay on track. The big difference between North and South Carolina, ideologically, is that North Carolina was much more accepting of different religious sects. They had Quakers and Calvinists and Huguenots. Most of the Puritans in America stayed up in the Bible Commonwealth, and most Anglicans preferred Virginia or, now, South Carolina. But North Carolina, the Albemarle province, much like New York, became a haven for religious exiles from all over the world. It's interesting to me that so many places which were more accepting of religious freedom and thus accepted exiles, became havens for piratical activity. I don't exactly know what conclusions to draw from that. People at the time would have told you it was the moral degradation of those inferior denominations, or maybe they'd get super xenophobic about the whole thing and tell you it's all those filthy foreigners, clearly a French influence. Personally, I think it's economic. English trade was still deep in the mercantile system and highly regulated. Non-English inhabitants of colonial holdings enjoyed fewer rights, especially in the trading market. So those exiles had to turn to illegal methods of trade. 
and that, of course, brings in merchant shipping willing to engage in illegal activity at sea, which really is only a few steps removed from outright piracy. But there is another possible explanation. In her 1917 book, The Story of the United States, Henrietta Elizabeth Marshall writes, quote, The Protestants of France were called Huguenots, and they had to suffer at the hands of Catholic rulers. Louis XIV, who was at this time on the throne of France, forbade the Huguenots to worship God in their own way, and also he forbade them to leave the country on pain of death. But thousands braved death rather than remain and be false to their religion. Some were caught and cruelly punished, but many succeeded in escaping to Holland, England, and even to America. Many Huguenots now settled in Carolina. They were hard-working, high-minded people, and they brought a sturdiness and grit to the colony which it might otherwise have lacked. Germans, too, came from the Palatinate, driven thence also by religious persecutions. Irish Presbyterians fleeing from persecution in Ulster. Jacobites who, having fought for the Stuarts, found Scotland no longer a safe dwelling place, came seeking a new home. These were all hardy, industrious people, but besides these there came many worthless idlers. These came because, in the early days, when the colony was but sparsely peopled and more settlers were wanted, a law was passed that a new settler need not pay any debts he had made before he came to the colony, and for a year after he came he need pay no taxes. These laws brought, of course, many shiftless folk who, having got hopelessly into debt somewhere else, ran away to Carolina to get free of it. Indeed, so many of these undesirables came that the Virginians called Carolina the Rogue's Harbor. End quote. Now that passage, well, I've got some issues with it. It does give a good breakdown of the Protestant immigrants to the Carolina colony, and a good, reasonable at least, explanation of why it was called the Rogue's Harbor. What it does not do is give us a fair reason why so many of those debtors were forced to come to America in the first place. She paints them as lazy, unindustrious undesirables. She even, at one point, calls them poor whites, which is full of its own super-racist, post-slavery American connotations. But in her estimation, it was all very much their own fault. In reality, the debt system in most of Europe at the time was built specifically to keep even the hard-working people in an endless cycle of debt. It's how you deal, if you are a rich landowner, with the abolition of feudalism. But it's not a terrible passage. The rest of the book gets pretty abysmal. Marshall's account of slavery and the... Rice fields of Carolina is even worse, but we're going to get to that rice in a minute. For now, that's North Carolina. But South Carolina, the Clarendon province, well, they had bigger problems. That 31st parallel, the modern Georgia-Florida line, was Spanish territory. More accurately, or technically, it was really Indian territory, north of St. Augustine, and it's difficult to pin down who exactly lived where and for how long when it comes to Native American peoples at the time. The land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean was in turmoil. In modern South Carolina, you would find tribes like the Kofitacheki and Kusabo peoples. Down south of that, closer to the Savannah River, you would find the Tama and Guayo peoples. But the dominant force in the region, the largest grouping, the most militarily powerful Native American tribe, was the Muscogee, also called the Creek people. Due to European encroachment, from Spain and England mainly, they formed the Muscogee Confederation, a large military alliance that stretched from Florida to Virginia. Now all of those other tribes that I just mentioned were not technically part of the confederation, for the most part, but they fed and supplied this military alliance, and occasionally some of them sent warriors to ride with the Muscogee. That 
Confederation kept the encroaching French and English interests at bay. But as for the Spanish, they had... Well, they weren't friends, exactly. You might call them mortal frenemies. The Spanish were permitted to build missions in Muscogee land, but they were not permitted any large settlements north of St. Augustine. In return, the Spanish supplied their allies with guns. Now, this did occasionally come back to bite them. The Spanish and Muscogee did fight from time to time, but by and large, Spain was happy with the arrangement. This large and Spanish-supported, militarily powerful Native American coalition created kind of a, a no-man's land between Florida and Virginia. It protected the northern border of Spain's West Indian colonies, Florida, from England. This arrangement had been in place for generations now, almost since the time of Columbus, at least he was still alive when it came into being. But it began to crumble when tribes from the north immigrated down to the south. In the 1650s, England started moving their forces into Canada, French territory. This set off the resumption of the Beaver Wars between the Algonquin and Iroquois peoples. We've mentioned all of that before. But at first in these resumed Beaver Wars, the English and the Iroquois did really, really well they pushed a bunch of Algonquin people off of their land. However, rather than just, you know, murder them all, the English offered the Algonquins a proposition. Look, they said, there is a bunch of land down to the south. It's lush and it's warm and it's fertile. But it's also occupied. If you do, though, want to go down there and take it, we'll help you out. We'll supply you with guns and horses and food and clothing, and we'll set you up with a trade alliance so that we can both prosper together. And beyond that, you won't ever have to come back into contact with the hated Iroquois. You'll have new land, and you'll have us backing you 100%. To their credit, this was not some kind of dirty trick. The Algonquin were given food and clothing food and clothes that weren't rancid or infested with smallpox. The horses that the English gave them were healthy pack animals mostly, but they were good for breeding. The English in all of this kept their word. And once the Algonquin reached Virginia's southern border, they were in fact handed lots of guns. Pretty good guns, not the best maybe, but fine firearms and plenty of shot and powder to go along with it. Then they were just sent on their way, to travel south to settle new homes in the beautiful American Southeast. What a friendly bunch of folks these English are, right? There are those contemporary histories that would have you believe that the Algonquin people were tricked into this, but I don't think that's the case. They weren't stupid. They'd already been allied with the French, but they'd been defeated. But here they were given another chance. They'd have to switch their alliance to the English and fight an unfamiliar people in an unfamiliar land, but, well, it's better than genocide. Which gave rise, in the late 1650s, to a new war between these Algonquin people from up in Canada and the Muscogee Confederation in Georgia, South, and North Carolina. Within about ten years, the Muscogee were pushed south of the Savannah River, and there they held the line. But the English allied Algonquin held what we would later call Carolina. This all sets the stage pretty perfectly for the English to found new cities and forts all along the coast. Now this was all still dangerous. Spain still considered that land theirs. Or, you know, not theirs exactly, but the Muscogee, but definitely not England's. Every attempt by the English and the French to settle anywhere near Florida had been met with battle and burning, and massacre. It was all pretty horrific. You'll recall that Francis Drake made great hay out of one such instance. But Spain made their position very clear. Do not settle here. You can have the cold part of the continent, but move too close and we will kill you. Which brings us to 1666, and an expedition planned and funded by the eight lords proprietor. 
an expedition to be led by Sir Robert Sandford, an expedition that employed a surgeon out of Barbados named Dr. Henry Woodward. The actual mission itself isn't particularly interesting. It was less a voyage of exploration and more a mission to establish trade ties with the Native Americans in the region. Sanford met with a number of tribes and chiefs, but most notably for our story, the Kusabo. Their chief agreed to an exchange of people. Not a prisoner exchange or a hostage exchange exactly, but Dr. Woodward was going to stay with the Kusabo while one of the chief's daughters would sail off with the English. In theory, when both are returned safe and hopefully not pregnant, there will be trust built between the two sides. What we know about this period of time in Dr. Woodward's life is limited. He did keep a... well, not a journal, he kept notes. It's all about language and flora and fauna and what crops might grow well in Carolina. There's nothing about the day-to-day, -day, not even the big things. For example, we don't know how Henry Woodward wound up in St. Augustine as a, a guest of the Spanish. We don't know if he was a prisoner exactly. Maybe he was, and there are records in London that suggest as much. And it's those records that tell us most of what we know about this period in Woodward's life. For example, he had been given a huge piece of land in Carolina from the Lord's proprietor. It looks like, most probably, the Spanish may have caught wind of that English expedition to the Carolina colony and sailed north to see what exactly was going on, hopefully to intercept them. But by the time the Spanish arrived, most of the Englishmen had gone. Woodward was the only man left. So the Spanish arrested him. We do know that Woodward would spend almost a year in St. Augustine. He would serve as a doctor during that time and convert to Catholicism. And, well, we do have a number of letters and records by Dr. Woodward to Spanish officials there in St. Augustine. But none of those are written in Spanish. They're written in Latin. Woodward didn't speak Spanish, at least not when he arrived, but he would learn. He was kind of a genius when it came to language. English, Spanish, Latin, probably Dutch, and a host of southeastern Native American languages. He spoke a ton of tongues. But all of this, the serving as a doctor, the converting to Catholicism, it may have been under duress as a prisoner. It looks like he was held against his will. When, later on, an opportunity to escape arose, when it fell into his lap, Henry Woodward jumped at the chance. This happened in 1668. Let me set the stage here. Port Royal Jamaica was, at exactly this time, just growing to the heights of piratical activity that would make it the wickedest city on all the earth. Earlier that year, Henry Morgan had attacked Portobello, and he was on his way to Maracaibo. The Brethren of the Coast, from Tortuga mainly, were wreaking havoc all over the West Indies. Aside from Morgan, probably the most prominent captain, active at the time, was a man named Robert Searle. Now, I didn't really give Robert Searle the time that his story deserves when we talked about the Port Royal Privateers, and... We don't have time here today to do it either. But he, if not for Morgan, would have been number one, the most famous and most notorious. Robert Searle sailed with Mings and Mansvelt, if you'll recall those two, in the really early days of Port Royal. And it was on one of those voyages that he earned his ship Cagway. He was among the most prominent captains to sail with Edward Morgan. Henry Morgan's uncle, on the voyage that would claim Edward's life, which marked a decline in Robert Searle's career. Under Governor Modiford, and thanks to the shifting politics back in Europe, Robert Searle found himself turned from something of a, you know, a go-to guy in Port Royal to a pariah. In an attempt to turn all of this around, he captured a huge prize, two Dutch merchantmen filled with slaves and plunder, and a not insubstantial amount of hard coin. He brought them into Port Royal. He unloaded the governor's share of slaves and coin, and they were still sitting in the harbor when a letter arrived from London. An order signed by the king 
telling them to cut all of this privateering out. Now that letter was dated prior to Searle's capturing of those two Dutch vessels, and because the king's signature is what made it an official document, that's when it goes into effect on the date that he signed it. Even though it had just arrived, and everybody, including Searle and Modiford, just learned about it, Modiford decided to make an example of Robert Searle. He tried to arrest the now pirate for his crimes, even though nobody knew it was a crime at the time. But Robert Searle, always on his toes, managed to escape. Now, I told you last time that Charlestown in the Bahamas, what would become Nassau, served as a kind of last resort, a hideout for the buccaneers, a place to relax while the heat dies down. It served the same purpose here for Robert Searle, or at least he wanted it to. Instead, when Cagway arrived, the town, the island of New Providence, was in turmoil. The people had just endured a terrible attack by the Spanish. You know, murder, rape, theft, burning. Real, well, pirate stuff. Robert Searle and his men, they were outraged, and they decided to do something about it. So the Cagway, along with a ship that was accompanying him and a number of smaller vessels from there at Charlestown, decided to sail out for a bit of revenge. Now, we talked about this raid way back when. It really, really upset the Spanish. Played a role in the instigation of the Second Anglo-Spanish War. We're talking about a fleet of ships, a small fleet, but a fleet nonetheless of pirate ships sailing into the harbor at St. Augustine, and opening fire with the big guns. They set one of the ships in the harbor alight, and then landed a party ashore to murder and rape and steal and burn. There was a, a long-running feud between Charlestown in the Bahamas and St. Augustine. They traded blows back and forth all the time, and this could have been another one of those, but this time, thanks to the firepower, and leadership that Robert Searle brought to the table, this was worse. The raid took some time. They had their way with the town for several days. And it was in that time that Dr. Woodward had a chance to escape. Now, again, he doesn't chronicle his escape, or at least a chronicle of it has not come down to us. We don't have the details, but you just know that it was an amazing story. I imagine Dr. Henry Woodward, in the dead of night, asleep in a cushy bed in a fine house, but a house that served as his prison, probably the magistrate's home where he practiced his medicine. But he was awoken by screams, followed by gunshots. He would, you know, get up and rush to the window, only to see a roving band of murderous pirates marching through the streets. If he was not a prisoner, if he was there of his own volition, why would he look at those men, covered in blood, and think, this is my chance? Maybe he sneaked downstairs, or maybe he opened his window and scaled the wall down. I imagine him running in the local Spanish militia, who would likely try to have captured him. They knew his face. But he fled, and finally, after running through a town that was on fire, he found the pirates. Pirates who, remember, would not have recognized him. They likely would have tried to kill him, or take a shot at him at least. But they either missed, or Dr. Woodward was a fast talker. The reality of the situation is this. For whatever reason, Dr. Woodward did choose to sail away with the pirates. There were those whispers that he would have preferred to stay in St. Augustine with the Spanish, that he was a a traitor to England. But they were discredited, even during his lifetime. When the pirates left St. Augustine, Dr. Woodward went with them. He would sail on board Cagway, under Captain Searle as the ship's doctor. But only for a while. He apparently traveled with several different buccaneer crews. The details here are even more scant than those in Carolina or St. Augustine. But we do know that in 1669, his ship crashed off of Nevis. The crew of that pirate ship, whatever ship it may have been, dispersed to other buccaneer crews in the region, but not Searle. 
he chose to stay there on Nevis. He had had word that there was yet another voyage sailing from Bermuda to colonize Carolina, and they were planning to stop off at Nevis on the way, and Woodward still owned a huge swath of the Carolina territory, so he decided to, rather than continue sailing with the buccaneers, to wait for them. Frankly, it's a kind of story that's hard to believe. If there were not such a sense of surprise and disbelief from the people that were on that Carolina fleet, and so much correspondence about Dr. Woodward and his questionable loyalties, if there had not been so much talk about him at the time, I wouldn't believe that story myself. But that is how it happened. Dr. Woodward would sail with the Carolina fleet from Nevis back to Carolina and the Cusabo chief. In fact, this was the voyage that brought his daughter back to him. It appears that the leaders of this expedition expected to find Dr. Woodward here with the Cusabo. He was supposed to have been gathering information, but instead they found him on Nevis. Still, he did have those copious notes about the Carolina Territory. He had a ton to tell them. He was integral to their founding of Charlestown in Carolina, modern-day Charleston. For the rest of his life, Dr. Woodward would be one of the most prominent figures in Charlestown. Not a politician, really, but, I mean, he owned the territory. He made a killing on the founding of Charlestown. He would also serve as one of their doctors, but none of that is why Dr. Woodward is most well-known. There's a story, probably an apocryphal story, but it's widely repeated, about Dr. Woodward and the arrival of Rice in Carolina. Thanks to his years as a buccaneer surgeon, Dr. Woodward had contacts in the seedier side of the Atlantic maritime trade. One such associate was a man named John Churcher, a figure that we introduced last time. He was an interloper, a pirate, and an agent of Frederick Phillips, as well as a customer of Adam Baldrige. John Churcher sailed the coasts of Africa and Madagascar for years before Adam Baldridge ever arrived. He was intimately familiar with those waters. That apocryphal story tells us that in 1687, John Churcher stopped off at Charlestown, Carolina to take in wood and water. There he met with Dr. Woodward, who it appears he already knew, and mentioned that he had a bag of seed rice on board. Malagasy rice from Madagascar. Now, I don't want to delve into the entire history of rice here, but indigenous American rice, what's often called wild rice, is a different species from traditional rice. Now, Europeans and Native Americans, obviously, were cultivating that all over the Americas. But this story, again, probably not true, this story would have you believe that John Churcher introduced the first foreign rice, in this case Malagasy rice, to America. Henry Woodward took that rice and found that it grew really amazingly well in Carolina. Now that's probably not how it happened. Rice from Asia and Africa, different varieties, were being grown all around Central America and the Caribbean. Most historians believe that that rice could have found its way up to Carolina with ease already. Perhaps, though, not Malagasy rice, which really, really took off in Carolina. I mean, you plant the stuff and it just, you know, takes over. You've got so much you don't know what to do with it. So much that... So much that the colonists can't hope to plant and harvest all of it on their own. They're going to need to bring in outside labor. That is what John Churcher introduced to Carolina. Not a bag of seed rice they could have bought from any passing merchant, but slaves. At least, illegally obtained slaves. Cheap labor for the Carolina rice farms. Dr. Woodward, thanks to his ties to the pirates so familiar with the coast of Africa, would build an entirely new market for illegally obtained slaves. A market that was suddenly very, very important. Growing all of that rice was a big deal for the English Empire. 
You know, rice keeps really well on board a ship, and you don't have to rely in that case on imported grain or what little grain Britain can produce. Charlestown, Carolina became within just a few years of its founding one of the most important food suppliers of the English-speaking world, one of the most prominent cities in America thanks to all of that. And yeah, they bought slaves from time to time from the Royal Africa Company. You can't buy all of your slaves under the table or somebody is going to notice. But most of those, thanks to their ties to St. Mary's and New York, to Adam Baldridge and Frederick Phillips, most of those were illegally obtained. Because of that, so many people who operated outside of the law as interlopers and smugglers who would go on to become pirates of the round in just a couple of years. Well, they all became intimately familiar with the swamplands very nearby, lands in which they could hide from the authorities almost indefinitely. Because of all of that, Charleston, South Carolina, is about to become one of the most important pirate haunts in all the world. It's the missing piece between Madagascar and Nassau and New York. Next time, we're going to look at a different Charles. Not a town, but a ship. A Spanish ship called the Charles II, or really Carlos II. It was a ship on which William Dampier and a former Navy man named Henry Every were about to book passage. We've been talking a lot lately about the English. English pirates and interlopers and slave merchants. And that's honestly just kind of how it's going to be for a while. There are going to be a few prominent French and Dutch and Ottoman and American and Chinese pirates in the future. But the golden age of piracy is really an English story. We can, though, thank a Dutchman for it. If you're feeling metaphorical, maybe a flying Dutchman. I'm talking about William III, King of England. His policies directly influenced, or if we were going to be bold about it, we could even say created the golden age of piracy. Let me take you back to the summer of 1688, immediately prior to the Glorious Revolution. William of Orange had just received the invitation to invade, and he was amassing his invasion force. It was that August, when London was ablaze with talk of invasion and preparations for warfare, that was when William Phipps arrived with a staggering amount of treasure in the hold of his ship. He was returning from the West Indies, and his treasure-hunting expedition on the wreck of La Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. There are those who would tell you that the 1715 wreck of the Spanish treasure galleon on the coast of Florida is the most important windfall in pirate history. I mean, I might tell you that at some point in the future, but it's not true. La Nuestra Señora de la Concepción just, in my opinion, ekes out a win. That was the prize that set off the golden age of piracy, as well as the careers of a number of famous pirates, notably at least William Kidd and Henry Every. So today we're going to look at the largest and most direct of those repercussions. This is episode 195, London Town. I can only imagine what it must have been like for William Phipps when he arrived in London in 1688. Here he was with over 200,000 pounds sterling in Spanish silver. Here he was with this almost unbelievable fortune intended for the King of England, and Phipps went almost unnoticed. His patron, the Duke of Albemarle, noticed. He hosted him at his estate and took his cut of almost 50,000 pounds. But the king and most of his court just passed Phipps on by. They were busy, of course. I mean, they were freaking out. William III was clearly massing a fleet intended to invade England. Parliament and way too many prominent lords were in open rebellion against King James. King Louis over in France was making really loud noises about a really big war. 
They knew that William Phipps had arrived with that pile of money, and they would happily take that money to fund the war, but right now was no time for ceremony. I can't help but wonder if the Duke of Albemarle, who was usually one step ahead of the game, I can't help but wonder if he counseled William Phipps to hold back, you know, wait a month or so to go see the king, because within the month William of Orange invaded England, and with almost no fighting, James II was fleeing for exile in France, and William III sat the throne. Now, as you might imagine, King William was pretty busy for those first few weeks, but he did find time to acknowledge William Phipps. And he must have been just ecstatic to find out that there was this skull-duggerous colonial waiting in the wings with about 125,000 pounds sterling in hard specie for the king. Any of us would be happy, I imagine, to get 125 large, but William especially must have been gleeful here because when he came to the throne, he learned that England was broke. Like, really broke. If there's one thing that every Stuart monarch of England had in common, it was their inability to manage money. However, even though that 125,000 pounds was worth a lot more in 1688 than it is today, it still wasn't enough to just solve England's financial woes. But if they invested it, and invested it well, it could turn their fortunes around. But that wasn't a job for the king. To see that job done, William turned to one of the richest and most powerful families in London. The Hublon family. The Hublon were of French extraction originally. They were Huguenots that fled France in the 1660s. Notably, they married into an even more wealthy and more powerful Huguenot family who fled Flanders back when Queen Elizabeth sat the throne. Here in 1688, there were three Hublon brothers that ran the family's affairs. The eldest was James Hublon, followed by Abraham and John. All three men served in Parliament at different times and ran large business interests. But they were exiles there in London, despite all of their wealth and influence. They held no lands in England, no titles. Presumably, they could get a posting at court if they really wanted one, but it wouldn't be on any of the important councils, just some kind of bureaucratic job, which would not do. Instead, they invested their money in a number of joint stock companies, including a quaint little startup you may have heard of called the English East India Company. When William III received his windfall from William Phipps, he took one look around London and decided that these were the guys. This was who he would choose to handle his giant pile of Spanish silver. Essentially, he gave those three brothers all the money. It's a bit more complicated, but that's basically how it went down. He just handed it to them and told them to take it and turn it into a lot more money. He needed to see the broken economy of England fixed and hopefully earn enough to build a navy to rival France. That was the big issue here. England's navy was in poor shape. They were, after all, broke, and three successive Anglo-Dutch wars will take its toll on naval forces. That's well, that's why England keeps losing naval battles in the Nine Years' War. They didn't have a lot of ships. Those who blown brothers, as you might imagine, were more than happy to take up this mission on behalf of the Crown. And to see it through, they founded the Bank of England. And if you want to picture the Bank of England, I mean the, the physical bank, you could look it up online, or you could just watch the Harry Potter movies. The Bank of England is Gringotts. I mean, almost exactly. The site of that initial Bank of England on Threadneedle Street in London was the Hublon family home. It was a mansion in the center of London, but the three brothers decided to convert it into the inaugural site of the Bank of England. The youngest brother, John Hublon, was put in charge. He was named the inaugural governor of the Bank of England, and the other two brothers, 
James and Abraham Hublon, had business interests elsewhere. Their very first order of business, though, in running the Bank of England, was to infuse a huge amount of money into the English East India Company. Abraham Hublon, the middle brother, facilitated that transfer of wealth. He was in a good position to do so as he sat on the board of the English East India Company. Remember a few episodes back when I told you that the English East India Company was a big company, yeah, but not that big. They were in the we-gotta-get-this-nutmeg-to-market business, not the let's-go-conquer-India business. Well, all of that is about to change, at least begin to change, here with this infusion of cash. That's not going to have any immediate effects that we will feel, but keep it in mind. I mean, the East India Company and the Indian Ocean are pretty important to the pirates of the round. But as for those immediate effects, for today, I want to focus on the eldest brother, James Hublon. James was... Well, I just... I can't begin to imagine what his life must have been like. He was an intellectual, or rather, he saw himself as an intellectual. He was patron to a bunch of actual intellectuals. And we're talking big names here. Diarists like Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn. Scientists like, well, the whole of the Royal Society of London. You know, Robert Boyle, who kind of invented modern chemistry. Or, oh, Mr. Haley, I see you named a comet after yourself. Good show, old chap. What about Isaac Newton? He knew all of them, and they all knew him. Of course, James Hublon was not their equal, intellectually. He was too busy being the mayor of London, and an MP, and director of the newly founded Bank of England, which was a distinct position from governor, as his brother was. But James Hublon was the kind of man who would have all of those famous names over for dinner. I cannot imagine a more impressive and fascinating and stimulating dinner. You know, Isaac, why don't you tell us about this new discovery of yours? What did you call it again? Mm, physics? And yeah, if I'm being honest here, given the chance, I'd rather sit on the beach somewhere drinking rum with the sound of a Spanish guitar playing in the background and a big hunk of roast cow over the bonfire. To spend my time with scurrilous pirates and women of low moral character, that sounds like a lot more fun to me, but of course, that's just me. I'm a, a Philistine. But there is an exception to that rule. There is one time when I would choose John Hublon's fancy dinner party with scientists and women of high moral character, over a beachside barbecue. And that was when Hublon hosted a young man, courtesy of the Royal Society of London, who had only recently returned from a voyage round the world. Upon his return to England, William Dampier was a guest of everybody. Dampier, of course, had quite the story to tell. He had Years of sailing with pirates and buccaneers, uh, a voyage into the South Seas, and their crossing to Asia, which to England was still kind of a mystery at the time. He had tales of the Philippines and Indonesia. There was that landmass that William Dampier was still tentatively calling Australia's Incognita. There was Vietnam and India and Madagascar. But William Dampier... Despite all of these fantastic stories, well, he had nothing to show for it. His sea chest, what was supposed to be the seed money, his, you know, his fortune upon his return to England, was gone. The only object of any monetary value that he'd brought back with him was his slave, Jolie, from Mindanao, covered in tattoos. But upon his return to England, after only a few weeks... William Dampier had been forced to sell Gioli just to make ends meet. When Dampier got back to England, he had a life to get back to, and a, a wife to get back to. He was married to a woman, 
named Judith, that he had not seen in twelve years. They were in their early twenties when they got married, and now they were closing in on forty. I mean, what does that even look like, that kind of reunion? Hello, you're, uh, you're Judith, right? You know, I think that, uh, I think we're married. Judith was working as a servant, while Dampier was out of the country. And Dampier made enough with the sale of Geoli to a, a local theater company, as it happened, a company that would stage fantastical and not-at-all-accurate stories with this tattooed native as a centerpiece, but Dampier made enough to buy he and his wife a humble little home there in London. But that was all he had money for. Judith had to keep working to feed them. The house itself, it... Well, it wasn't great. It lay on the bank of the Thames, which... Well, Diana and Michael Preston will give a better description of that than I could. They write in A Pirate of Exquisite Mind, quote, The Thames was full of rubbish and waste from industries like tanneries along the banks, which discharged into it their acrid vats of dog turds and urine used to soften leather. The river smelled horrible, particularly when the ooze and its decaying contents were exposed at low tide. John Evelyn wrote, and here they quote John Evelyn, quote, Dirty and nasty it is at every ebb, so as next to the hellish smoke of the town, there is nothing, doubtless, which does more to impair the health of its inhabitants. End quote. We could spend, if we really wanted to, an entire episode devoted to London Town and how unbelievably disgusting it was. They go on to tell us in A Pirate of Exquisite Mind that the birth rate in London was not enough to replenish the death rate. The only way that London managed to keep their population steady and growing was with immigrants to the city, who came there for good and better paying jobs. But I can't imagine that Judith, who even though she was a servant and not at all wealthy, had been living in a fairly nice house, the house of her mistress, I can't imagine she was at all pleased with her newfound circumstances. I'm not even going to try to imagine what went through her head when her husband, I guess, when Dampier was so heartbroken at being forced to sell his tall and muscular, long-haired, tanned and tattooed slave boy, who had at the time been so worth the expense. All Dampier had to show for his twelve years of sailing off to earn his fortune was a pile of papers. Now, I have trouble characterizing Judith in my head. We just don't know enough about her. I mean, it's not like she and Dampier ever had any kind of correspondence to refer to. It would be easy to portray her as you know, kind of a shrew, right? Oh, you didn't make any money, but you managed to save a chest full of papers. And all you do day in and day out is pour over those old notes and cry over Jolie. What about me? I have needs too, you know, but... We don't know anything about the kind of relationship that she and Dampier had. And, you know, we don't know, but it's possible that Judith was involved in her husband's work, that she was fascinated by all of those papers. Considering the trends of literacy and the publishing market in English society, as well as William Dampier's pretty abysmal handwriting, it's even possible that Judith, you know, copied and compiled and edited his notes into a cohesive and readable work. At least, that's what William Dampier was getting up to. The only possession that he owned of any value at all was his notes, which he was turning into a book. And once he had a readable manuscript completed, he shopped it all around town. The Royal Society of London was intrigued in this work. Worldwide wind patterns were important, as were a number of the discoveries he made, but they weren't going to front the money to publish it. When Dampier went to that dinner party hosted by James Hublone, yeah, he was telling stories at the dinner table, but it was all in an attempt to sell his book. And it was at that dinner that he finally, 
after about a year of trying, when he succeeded. He finally had a patron, someone who was interested in putting up the money to see that work published. Now, it wasn't James Hublon, but the younger brother, the governor of the Bank of England, John Hublon. Did I mention earlier that John Hublon was also a Lord Commissioner of the Admiralty? No? Well, he was. And those maps of wind patterns were important. They were important to the Navy, to the war effort, to God and country. James Hublon wanted to see them published. In their biography of William Dampier, Diana and Michael Preston have an entire segment of the book entitled Celebrity. Once a new voyage round the world was making the rounds of London, William Dampier and Judith no longer had to worry about money. They were able to move away from their house on the Thames into a much better place in Soho. They were attending more and more fancy dinner parties. Dampier was spending most of his days at the coffee houses, which were the centers of social life in London. He wasn't doing it to sell his book, but rather to publicize it, to hype it up. Everyone wanted to hear William Dampier tell his stories. He even managed to negotiate a 10% royalty from the theater company that had bought Jolie. Not to tell Dampier's stories, they weren't going to do that, they wanted magic and romance, but for the mere right to use William Dampier's name on the playbill. That's the kind of fame that he achieved almost overnight. Now I have to avoid the temptation of turning this into a biography of William Dampier. There is a bigger story here today, but I do want to mention one little tangent. You'll recall that back in May 1688, the pirate ship Bachelor's Delight put in at Philadelphia after five years of roving. It was there that William Dampier's former commander, Edward Davis, and William Dampier's friend, Lionel Wafer, left Bachelor's Delight. They just handed the ship over to the crew, who voted in George Rayner as their captain. From Philadelphia, with their sea chests in hand, Edward Davis and Lionel Wafer made their way down to Virginia. Davis used a good portion of his money to buy some land in Virginia, which was a good thing at just the right time. About a month later, on 22nd June 1688, Lionel Wafer, Edward Davis, and their two companions, one of them a slave, were arrested for piracy. They were subsequently tried and imprisoned. They languished away in that cell for two years, trying to secure a release, petitioning anyone who might listen. Finally, though, Dampier had the clout to give them the help they needed. He called in a number of favors, finally turning to his patron, John Hublon. As a naval official, John was interested to learn that Lionel Wafer had his own maps and his own charts and a diary full of flora and fauna all over the world. Those works would eventually be published, thanks to the same naval and intellectual channels that got Dampier published, as a buccaneer's atlas. Hublon petitioned the king, and he had a lot more weight to throw around than William Dampier. William III finally granted Edward Davis and Lionel Wafer a royal pardon. But there was a catch here. The money. Edward Davis got to keep his land, and they would receive some compensation from the crown a couple of years later. But nearly all of the money that they earned sailing on board Bachelor's Delight, their years of work and blood, their own blood and the blood of others, nearly all of that money was confiscated. Not by the king, at least it didn't go into royal coffers, but by Virginia. The colony of Virginia used it to found a college, the College of William and Mary. That is yet another pretty major institution founded and funded on pirate booty. What are we up to today? Is that three institutions? Why not kick it up to four? That major investment in the East India Company was paying dividends to the Hublon brothers and to the Bank of England, and thus to England itself. They were loaning out money at excellent rates and 
in particular the Navy, was benefiting. But they could do more, both to help out the Navy and England and line their own pockets. See, James Hublon, the eldest of the brothers, made most of his personal fortune in a trade with Iberia, with Spain and Portugal. He was a wine merchant, trading for Spanish and Portuguese wine. It treated him very well as an industry, but in recent months, Hublon had run into problems. Pirates. French privateers were an issue, especially in the Bay of Biscay once the war broke out. James Hublon, in a petition before the Admiralty, complained that, quote, French privateers off the coast of Portugal intercepted and took several English and Irish ships, end quote, which was not news to anyone. The Admiralty were well aware of that fact, especially since they'd just lost the Battle of Beachy Head. They were losing the war at sea. Officers were deserting the Navy in droves. Clear throats significantly. Oh, wait. Officers were deserting the Navy in droves. <clears throat> but they were helpless, as of yet, to do anything about it. The even bigger issue, though, for James Hublon, were Barbary pirates. Sally Rovers out of Morocco. Now, ever since Admiral Narborough put down Tunis and Tripoli back in 1671, the Barbary coast had been relatively quiet. But wouldn't you know it, as soon as the Nine Years' War broke out, suddenly Barbary pirates were everywhere. Naturally, the Ottoman Empire had nothing to do with it. They weren't part of this war. They hadn't declared war on anyone. The Barbary pirates just chose to attack exclusively English and Dutch and Spanish shipping. All of that, the French and Barbary raiders, had severely curtailed James Hublon's Siberian trade, along with a bunch of other merchants. And it looked like the Admiralty, the Navy, weren't going to do anything about it. So with this windfall of money from the Crown, and the profits that it had earned for he and his brothers, James Hublon announced the formation of a joint stock company. As Lord Mayor of London and the Director of the Bank of England, and brother to the Governor of the Bank of England, who was also on the Admiralty Board, all of that made this joint stock company look like a pretty safe bet. A lot of people, once he announced the formation, put up money for this operation. The King put up money for this new company. Lords and ladies and captains of industry, we're, we're talking about the cream of English society. Now at first there was a lot of infrastructure to put in place. An army of accountants and lawyers, a board of directors, the, the less sexy side of international trade corporations. But then there was their stock, what they were going to sell. What, what were they going to sell? Well, the king had a thought about that. Why not sell guns to our Spanish friends in the West Indies? As it happened, William III knew just the arms manufacturers back in Holland to supply all of the cargo there. Plus, you know, we are at war. The Spanish in America could use those guns in the fight against King Louis. It would be the patriotic thing to do, and let us not forget who handed you a giant pile of money. So they were going to sell guns. Muskets and pistols and shot and powder. You know, small arms, but also big guns and cannons. It, well, the arms trade, believe it or not, wasn't the most profitable expedition ever conceived. They were ordered to sell those guns as cheaply as possible. Not quite at cost, but only enough to cover their operating costs. So there was no profit to be made there, but there was a lot of news filtering back to England that a number of ships had been recently lost in the West Indies. Merchantmen and treasure ships that were carrying a lot of salvageable cargo. Ships that Hublon was now permitted to salvage once his job in America was done. The brothers Hublon knew, better than most in the world, exactly what kind of returns sunken treasure could afford them. So to that end, 
Once all of those investors had put their money down for what Hublon was calling the Spanish Expedition, they had to acquire ships for their voyage. The first ship that Hublon bought was the Seventh Sun. Seventh Sun was what they called a pink. The name derives from the Dutch word pink, but it means pinched. A pink has a very narrow stern and a shallow draft. They were designed to ride high on the water and maneuver in very tight spaces, specifically for coral reefs. On this mission, Seventh Sun was to serve as the salvage ship, the ship that could get men and cargo to and from the wrecked vessels. But of course, a pink isn't a powerhouse. So to fill that gap, they bought two frigates, Dove and James. Now, Dove and James were sent over to Holland to buy all of the guns that would be sold on this mission, as well as the guns that would arm their own vessels. Dove and James were going to have thirty guns each. Seventh Son was only going to carry eight, but the flagship was going to carry forty. Now, I don't think that William Dampier was on board yet. I mean, actually on board the ship. He was still in London enjoying coffee houses and dinner parties. In fact, his old friend Lionel Wafer had joined him by this point. Wafer's book had not yet been published, but Dampier's was flying off the shelves. They would tell tales of the Guna and Darien and the Mosquito Coast, tales that were enjoyed by all. But Dampier had, by this point, signed up to sail with the Spanish expedition. He was going to serve as second mate of the Dove, but really, his job wasn't to serve as an officer on board, but more of a marketing executive. In the same way that he had leveraged his sudden fame into a 10% share in that theater company, now he was going around telling everybody exciting and fanciful tales and then mentioning off the cuff, you know, hey, I'm doing a new thing. You should definitely invest. Dampier is going to be the public face of this voyage. But we will talk more about the rest of the crew next time. However, today, I want to end with a crewman that stands out in the record. While the Dove and the James were off on their mission in Holland, construction was well underway on the flagship for this Spanish expedition, a ship they were to call the Charles II. We are going to talk a lot more about the Charles II next time. It's a ship that's going to concern us a great deal moving forward. But for now, she is still under construction, so we'll hold off on that. Instead, I want to look at the men who were brought in to command this flagship. The fleet had an admiral attached, a man named Arthur O'Brien. He was going to command the fleet from the flagship, Charles II. Below him, there was the flag captain. A, uh, a flag captain is a captain of a flagship under the admiral, but still technically in charge of his own vessel. That was a man named Robert Strong, who had served alongside William Phipps on the last expedition of this kind. Both of those men were skilled and hardy mariners, but they brought in a first mate for Charles II that was something of a special case, kind of a ringer. He was a former Navy man, a gunner and a master's mate who had served with distinction and earned honors in two major naval battles. There were, however, a few disturbing, although probably false rumors, that this particular former Navy man engaged in less than scrupulous trading in the year or so since he left the Navy. The word interloper had been thrown around more than once, but I mean, there's no evidence, so who's to say? And even if that were true, is it really that bad? I mean, it's a mark of grit and determination. Just the kind of traits that they were looking for in a first mate. See, this operation had a lot of men involved that were in a similar situation. They had been privateers and interlopers and treasure hunters and salvagers, some of them smugglers, some of them pirates. 
That's the kind of man that was needed for a job like this. A voyage to the West Indies to hunt treasure and trade with Spain. After all, it was men like that who sailed under Francis Drake. It was men like that who provided the capital for this very mission. Those kind of men were almost folk heroes in the English imagination. But they were an unpredictable lot. You are going to need somebody in a position of command who knows how to deal with that sort. Now, on a traditional English vessel, there wasn't a position that equated to a pirate quartermaster. You know, a a representative of the crew who had equal power to the captain. That position didn't exist. But as first mate, that is essentially the job that Henry Every was hired to do on the Spanish expedition. However, to the horror of every single man and woman who had put their money up for this expedition, that's exactly what Henry Every was going to do. Last time, we discussed events in London following the arrival of William Phipps and his massive haul of Spanish silver. We discussed the founding of the Bank of England and the groundwork being laid for what they were calling the Spanish Expedition, a voyage that would bring William Dampier and Henry Every together. And I told you that today we were going to continue that story. And we were, that was the plan, but we aren't. Because while William Dampier and Henry Every and a host of reputable sailors and less reputable scallywags were preparing for their voyage, well, the very final touches were being put on the Charles II, spring 1692. The French attacked. This is episode 196, For Ufibla. I keep telling you that we're going to catch up with the Nine Years' War on the continent, and I keep not doing it. But really, we do need to take a minute and pull back to look at the war as a whole so far. Let's start with the basics here. The Nine Years' War was almost exclusively about checking French power in Europe. France, in the early 1690s, was ascendant. Louis XIV was the Sun King, and it was becoming increasingly clear that his expansionist policies had to be stopped. If they failed to do so, there would be no balance of power left in the European world. The scales would all be tipped in France's favor. Almost everyone was against France here. The Holy Roman Empire was the cornerstone of the alliance against France. Now, the Holy Roman Empire was made up of a host of relatively independent principalities and duchies and smaller states in Germany and Italy and Central and Southern Europe. At the center of the empire, of course, was Austria, where the Habsburg ruling family was from, but here in 1692 there was another state in the empire that was rivaling Austria's power and shortly to rival her influence. That state was called Brandenburg, Prussia. And it was really this war that was going to bring them to the world stage. But beyond the Holy Roman Empire, the alliance against France included Spain and the Spanish Empire, Portugal, Savoy, Denmark, Sweden, which here in 1692 included modern-day Norway, and of course the Netherlands and England. If you were to look at a map of Europe circa 1692, you would see that France is surrounded. The question here is, if France was so outnumbered, why was this a nine years' war? Why not a six-month war that left France in shambles? That's what it looks like should have happened. Well, there are a few very good reasons for that. First of all, France was miles ahead of the rest of Europe in terms of tactical warfare. Most of Europe was still stuck in the tactics used during the Thirty Years' War. More than that, they based their warfare around castles and siege craft. But if you recall the French Field Marshal Turin, 
You'll recall that his military philosophy was about mobility and speed and firepower. Turin would field legions of mounted dragoons that could claim any battlefield position they wanted to before the enemy even arrived. Those dragoons would hold that position until the larger body of the infantry and, at some point, the artillery showed up. This allowed the French to choose not only their placement on the battlefield, but also the battlefield itself. It was a huge advantage for any army. But then there's the sheer size of the French army. As always, France was outpacing all the rest of Europe in their birth rate and the survival to adulthood. Plus, you know, France is just big. They had more people than most of the other nations of Europe, and therefore they had more soldiers. At least more than any other individual army. But it wasn't just the army. Their navy was the largest in the world at the time. France produced their own timber and iron and copper, as well as flax, which they made into rope, and hemp was beginning to make an appearance there. They had everything they needed to build and supply and crew their ships there in France. So France had a big, well-armed navy and a huge, well-led army. They were able to capture and hold territory almost at will. But beyond the physical, military advantages that France had, they had a big political advantage as well. They had an absolute monarch. All decisions made in the war had to go through either King Louis or his war ministry. Then look at that list of nation-states that were allied against France. Think about all of the kings and senates and parliaments and councillors and prime ministers and war ministries and admiralties that all have to be consulted before any big moves take place. Now, I'm not fond of authoritarian military dictatorships. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that they're a bad thing, but you can't deny that they have a distinct military advantage. For example, on the Allied side, those allied against France in this war, there were generals who were bitter enemies. Men who'd fought against each other time and time again before they joined the League of Osberg. Men who had personal problems with each other. You know, commanders who had killed another commander's son or slept with their wife. There were a ton of personal and national animosities at play in the League. There's one general today who's going to lead one of the major battles we're going to mention, who was earlier in his career exiled from Prussia. He was hired by William III of Orange before the Glorious Revolution, and in this war he was chosen to have overall command of one of the fronts leading Prussian troops. These kind of problems were rampant in the Allied forces, but really it's not as bad as it might look at first glance. Despite the fact that there are armies and soldiers from all of those different nation-states, really... If we boil it down to brass tacks, there are only two men who sit at the very top in the League of Osberg. William III of England and the Netherlands, and Leopold I, Holy Roman Emperor. Now we've talked a great deal about England and the many challenges they faced going into this conflict, so we don't need to go into that again. Instead, I'd like to look briefly at the empire of Leopold I. Not just the Holy Roman Empire, though the larger Habsburg Empire. Austria, the home base of the Habsburg Empire, was... Well, they could only spare so many troops to fight on the front with France. Remember, we're only eight years removed from the Ottoman Empire knocking on the gates of Vienna here. The Franco-Ottoman alliance was still a thing, and of late the Ottomans had been making some threatening moves. A large number of Austrian troops had to guard the Eastern Front, so really it was Brandenburg, Prussia, that sent the lion's share of troops to the French Front. Now, if you aren't familiar with Brandenburg, Prussia, or really just Prussia, it's Germany. Not exactly. There would be a ton of territorial changes over the years, but Prussia was the nucleus of what would become the German Empire. The noble family in charge of Prussia was the House of Hohenzollern. At the outset of the Nine Years' War, they were led by a man named Frederick, 
Grand Elector of Prussia, but by the end of the war he would be known as King in Prussia. Still part of the Holy Roman Empire, but that's the impact that they're going to make in this war. And even if you've never heard of the Hohenzollerns, you've heard of the Hohenzollerns. That's the family that's going to produce Frederick the Great, the first Hohenzollern who's going to call himself King of Prussia, which was an important distinction. They're going to produce uh, Frederick William III, who's going to lead Prussia against the armies of Napoleon. Wilhelm I, who's going to forge the German Empire, and Wilhelm II, who's going to lead that empire into World War I and its death. The Hohenzollerns are one of the most important noble families from the 18th to the 20th century. They're going to be major players in everything, and this war is where the world really gets to know them. But beyond the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, Leopold I was also the de facto emperor of the Spanish Empire. Spain and Naples and the Spanish Netherlands and most of the rest of the world. The King of Spain, Charles II, was severely mentally and physically disabled, which left Spain and the empire in the hands of officially a bunch of corrupt bureaucrats, but in reality a bunch of Austrian women who really didn't care for Spain very much. All through the war, Leopold was sending letters and ambassadors to his relatives in Spain, reminding them that, hey guys, we are at war here, it would be a really big help if you could get your act together and attack France, maybe pull some of the pressure off the front. But then there are those northern kingdoms, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and technically they did have a military alliance with the Holy Roman Empire. They were required to send troops, and they did so. But they did not care at all about the Rhineland. They were way more concerned with Poland and with Russia. This was going to lead in just a few years to the Great Northern War, but that's another story. The point is, though, they weren't invested in this fight. When they did send troops, they sent the bare minimum, and they weren't sending their best. So the League of Augsburg, despite controlling most of Europe and a large percentage of the rest of the globe, they weren't as strong as they might look on paper. In 1692, France appeared to be winning. Now, I'm not going to delve into a blow-by-blow blow of the early days of the war. It's not going to inform our story of pirates and piracy. For example, you don't need to know about François-Henri de Montmorency, the Duke of Luxembourg and Marshal of France. He is a great general, but, you know, his name's not going to be on the test. But you do probably need to know that in 1690, Mamorency won the Battle of Fleurus. The Battle of Fleurus was the first major engagement, the first big set-piece battle of the war. It was a battle that everybody was aware was coming, but France had an ace up their sleeve. William III was tied down in Ireland at the time, but his Dutch troops were still there on the continent. However, when both sides were dancing around the Rhineland, looking for the right time to engage, everyone's worst nightmare came true. The Ottoman Empire attacked a fortress on the Danube, way to the east, and Austria was forced to pull a significant part of their army away from the French lines. They sent them to defend against the Ottomans. And they had to do so quickly, as fast as possible, or risk invasion from behind. If they'd had time, the League of Augsburg could have reinforced the line, replaced those troops. But the Duc de Luxembourg knew this was going to happen, and that was when he sent in that initial force of dragoons to pin the Allied forces down before sending in the rest of his army to surround and crush them. It was a surprising and staggering defeat that shook the League of Augsburg to its core. And then... That defeat was compounded by the one-two punch of England losing two naval battles at Bantry Bay and Beachy Head. By the end of the fighting season of 1690, it looked like France might just win this thing. And they intended to do so in 1691, 
France was going to push their objectives on three different fronts and maybe force the Allies to come to the bargaining table. The first front was the Spanish Netherlands. France intended to, and eventually succeeded, in besieging and capturing the fortress city at Mons. The second front was in the Rhineland, just to the south. And while France did make a pretty big push into the Rhineland, they didn't really capture too much territory. It could have been the place where they broke the Allied line, but the Allied line held. However, it was down to the south where things finally turned around in the Allies' favor, at least a bit. There were three independent states that lay between the southern French provinces of Dauphine and Provence and the northern Italian provinces of Milan and Genoa. There was the Duchy of Savoy, the County of Nice, and the Principality of Piedmont. Now, the politics and diplomacy are complicated down here and tied to the Holy Roman Empire, but all three of those states were allied against a French incursion. If France invaded, they would defend. But they weren't bound by any agreement to attack the French. Those three states lay in the Alps, and if anyone was foolish enough to invade, they would be easy to defend, but they needed their troops at home. And when France did finally invade, they were pushed back down the mountain. They took some pretty heavy losses in the fighting, so many that King Louis offered them terms of surrender, not the whole League of Augsburg, but the counts and dukes that controlled that alpine region. Those terms were rejected, but nonetheless the fighting was more or less done. Now it's not like the French really had to offer those terms of surrender. They could have thrown more troops at the Alps and eventually taken Savoy and Piedmont, but King Louis had plans for those troops elsewhere. In Brittany, in northwest France, at the tip of that peninsula where the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay and the Atlantic Ocean all meet, at the port of Brest, an invasion force was being rallied. The purpose of that invasion force and the fleet which was to carry them away was simple, to break through the English fleet in the Channel and land an army on English soil capable of restoring James II to the throne. Their forces were to be personally commanded by none other than James himself, who was to act as the overall commander on both land and sea. And he did have a number of marshals of France appointed to serve underneath him to command individual armies once they arrived in England. But we don't need to worry ourselves about their names because none of them are going to make it to England. The naval forces in question, though, we do need to worry about. As overall commander, James Stuart is nothing to sneer at here. He had served with distinction as a captain and an admiral in two Anglo-Dutch wars, and then as the Lord High Admiral of England, he knew his business here. But the French fleet massing at Brest was large, more than fifty, probably closer to sixty, ships of the line, and a host of gunboats and fire ships and sloops to harry the enemy. It was such a large armada that it had to be split into three smaller units, commanded by their own individual admirals. The largest of these fleets was to be commanded by the Comte de Tourville, who we met back at the Battle of Beachy Head. That squadron was comprised mostly of French regular soldiers. The second largest squadron was made up mostly of soldiers from the British Isles, Jacobites from Scotland and England, but mostly it was what remained of the Irish Royal Army. And then the third and smallest squadron was led by yet another admiral that we've met before, François-Louis Comte de chateau Renault. That squadron was made up largely of irregulars, which we should read in this context as privateers and, in some cases, buccaneers. Most of those smaller craft, the sloops and gunboats intended to harry the English, most of those were concentrated in this last fleet. They were to do what buccaneers do best. The French had two other forces of note as well. There was a small squadron waiting at Rochefort who was to meet up with this larger group in a few weeks' time, but most notably was the much-vaunted Toulon fleet, 
out of the Mediterranean, commanded by the Duc de Stray. That fleet, when they met up with the main body of the Armada there at Brest, would add an additional twelve ships of the line. These are all commanders that we know already, from either the Battle of Beachy Head or the Battle of Bantry Bay. We've seen them fight the English in this very same theater of war before. The difference here, though, is that their fleets are much larger than they ever had been before. And the same goes for the English as well. The Earl of Orford, Edward Russell, was in command of the Channel Fleet yet again. Or rather, he was still in command of the Channel Fleet. After the disaster at Beachy Head fell largely on the shoulders of his commanding officer, Orford had the unenviable job of rebuilding the English Channel Fleet as fast as possible. But he was in luck here. Everything that we talked about last time, that windfall of cash that arrived in 1688, the founding of the Bank of England, all of that had finally begun to pay dividends. The English Royal Navy was bigger. They had more ships. Their ships were bigger, too, and they were outfitted with all of the very best state-of-the-art equipment. Orford had turned the Channel Fleet into a really impressive machine of war, a defensive wall that it would be difficult for France to break. However, the Comte de Tourville had a plan here. It was supposed to go something kind of like this. The Toulon fleet, under Duc d'Estrée in the Mediterranean, was to sail around the Iberian Peninsula, through the Strait of Gibraltar, and up the coast of Portugal to the French port at Rochefort. Now this was going to be a dicey move. Spain and Portugal were at war with France, and that was a lot of Iberian coastline they were going to have to sail past. But if anyone could do it, the Duc d'Estrée was the man for the job. Once the Toulon fleet arrived at Rochefort, they were to pick up a squadron of Biscayner privateers and a few additional ships of the line. Then that force would sail on to Brest, where they would take up a position in the vanguard. Shortly after arriving at Brest, the Toulon fleet, backed up by the Rochefort Biscayners, would sail up to the mouth of the Channel and there they would hold that position. They would stand in a defensive posture. Meanwhile, the fleet at Brest would load up all of their thousands of soldiers on their fifty or sixty ships of the line. Now this was the really scary part. A maneuver like that takes time, and in doing so leaves the ships vulnerable. The English were definitely going to notice when the French began loading up thousands of soldiers onto an armada. And once they did, they would take the opportunity to either move on the Brest fleet immediately or take up the best possible positions in the channel. That's what the Toulon squadron was there for. They were to guard the fleet at Brest or, if need be, to engage the English to worry their plans to take those superior positions. Then, once all of the invasion force was loaded up on their ships of the line, the Toulon fleet would sail out in front. They would open fire on the English in a traditional ship-of-the-line engagement. Now, the French would be outnumbered here. The Toulon fleet was not as big as the Channel fleet. They did have the privateers under Chateau Renal and those Biscayners from Rochefort, but still not enough to defeat the English. However, while the English and the Toulon fleet were doing battle, James Stewart and the Comte de Treville would have free reign to land the largest invasion force on English soil ever. This invasion, had it succeeded, would have made real history here. It's the kind of thing that the French have been dreaming about and contemplating for millennia. Every time England and France went to war since since before England and France existed, there have been plans to land an invasion force on England from France. When Napoleon Bonaparte arrived victorious from his Italian campaign, he was ordered to try this himself, but he took one look at it and decided it just could not be done. In 1759, during the Seven Years' War, France tried again to land an army on English soil but they were pushed back. I mean, Nazi Germany couldn't pull it off, and they had the biggest air force in the world. The last commander to really pull it off was, with the exception of a few smaller forces, but to pull it off at scale was William the Conqueror. This planned invasion in 1692 could have changed the face of English history forever. 
But, of course, it's not going to. This isn't going to work either. Things began to go wrong immediately. The Toulon fleet never even made it out of the Mediterranean. The Duc d'Estrée was intercepted by an English squadron who engaged them in an indecisive battle. Indecisive, sure, but the French still had to pull back to refit and repair their vessels. The Toulon fleet was out of the fight before fighting even began. And the Rochefort squadron that the Duc d'Estrée was supposed to pick up on his way to Brest, they never got picked up. They just sat around, waiting for d'Estrée to arrive. Eventually, when they realized nobody was coming for them, they did take the initiative and head off to Brest on their own. But that was a delay of weeks. This was a... I mean, before the fleet even departed their port at Brest, this was a disaster. All of their careful planning was for nothing now. And if Admiral Tourville had had a choice in the matter, I imagine he would have scotched the whole operation. But Tourville did not have a choice. His orders, direct from King Louis XIV, were to engage the English regardless of their strength or situation. He was ordered to join battle whether they were strong or weak. What Louis told Tourville was an ancient French military maxim, a sign of their bravery and elan, to fight whether they were for Ufibla. An admirable sentiment, maybe, but foolish. The Allies did indeed notice Comte de Tourville loading thousands of soldiers onto ships of the line, and doing so very slowly, and there was no Toulon fleet in place to interrupt their countermeasures. Instead, naval forces from all around the Channel region had time to rally. Sir Ralph de Laval arrived at the rallying point first, followed the next day by Richard Carter. Then a large Dutch fleet arrived under Philips von Almond in the company of yet another English fleet under John Ashby. Now you don't need to remember those names, but I do want you to realize that every single one of those admirals was bringing 10 or 15 or 20 ships with them. The admiral of the fleet, Edward Russell, brought somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 ships of the line when he arrived. When the entire Allied force was assembled, they had more than 80 tall ships, plus dozens of smaller craft for support. This was an overwhelming force they had assembled. It was large enough to dispatch every ship that France had originally intended to send against them. When Tourville finally did set sail, he had only 37 ships of the line in his command. There were others he could have brought with him, but he didn't have the manpower to crew them. He had been forced to incorporate many of those privateer crews onto his big ships just to get a reasonably sized fleet in place. When the Rochefort fleet arrived, and eventually they did, his full complement, including ships of the line and smaller support craft, was only 50 sail. The French fleet pushed into the channel, but early on they stuck close to the coast of France, which was a good thing. On the 19th of May at 6 a.m., Tourville spotted the first English sails. I can only imagine the apprehension he must have felt when this wall of sails materialized on the horizon. Apparently, James II told Tourville that many of those ships were sure to defect when they saw his royal English banner flying atop the mast. You know, they were secret Jacobites the whole time, but Tourville was not so naive. He must have known that he was very, very fible. The wind was blowing east and a bit to the north, pushing Tourville and the French fleet directly toward the English, but they were moving slowly. A full four hours passed before the two armadas were finally close enough to engage, and I, well, I think about the terror that your average French gunner must have felt in those four hours, the prayers that they must have said, knowing that they had no chance of victory against this giant force of English and Dutch vessels, but knowing that nonetheless they were going to fight. It was Admiral Russell that opened fire first, with a, 
a mighty broadside from dozens of ships of the line, an almost overwhelming show of force right at the outset. And to their credit, the French did reply in kind. They returned fire, volley for volley. The problem, though, is that because the French were so numerically overwhelmed, they were just unable to divert the ships necessary to guard their flanks. All of those smaller craft that belonged to the English and Dutch were able to dart in, to make a quick strike and dart away. They were too small and fast to hit with these large ships of the line. Now, those smaller craft were too weak to do much damage to those big French ships, but it was enough to nip at their heels. If the French did try to engage some of those smaller craft, they would have opened themselves up to a huge broadside from a wall of cannon on the English and Dutch side. This fighting went on uninterrupted for hours. And just to stay afloat, just to stay alive, the French had to throw everything they had into the battle. The Allied Armada, on the other hand, could rotate ships and crews in and out of the fight. They were doing so four hours on, four hours off, so the men were relatively well rested on the Allied side. But the French got no breaks at all. By early evening, it was becoming clear that they were flagging. They were unable to keep up any longer. Their shots just weren't coming as fast. It must have been a huge relief then when a heavy flog blanketed the water. It shrouded the battle. There was a blessed moment of respite for the French. They had a chance to catch their breath. But then, just as darkness was really beginning to fall, out of a fog so dense that the French couldn't properly see each other, dozens of ships materialized out of the fog. I mean, imagine the tension in that fog, listening and straining to hear or maybe to see what was out there, knowing that something had to be coming. And then to the starboard, a sudden storm of big guns, just flashes of red and orange illuminating the darkness of fog and smoke and falling night. And then to the larboard on the other side, enemy sails would break through right on top of you, bearing down on you. And that's when you realize that you are surrounded. As darkness fell in the midst of that fog, the Dutch armada had arrived and surrounded the entire French fleet. This could have easily turned into an absolute massacre. The destruction of the entire French fleet was not unimaginable here. But then, just as it seemed certain that defeat and probable death was moments away, the wind shifted. It started blowing back to the west and to the south, out of the channel. Maybe someone was listening to all of those French prayers. Tourville did not waste any time ordering the fleet to cut free and open sails to run as hard as possible for the port at La Hague. There was a pair of fortresses and a number of gun batteries under which they could hide from the English. This was the only hope that the French had, but even still, the Allied fleet already had the wind. By the time the French were well and truly moving away, they were being fired upon. Before they were able to properly escape, they were engaged in a running battle. Now, they did manage to outpace the Allied fleet, but not for long. Those few hours running from that battle were arguably the worst that the French had faced yet. They were exhausted, they were beyond exhausted, and their morale was already completely broken. They ran, they ran as hard as they could, but they could never quite escape. Twice over the next 48 hours, the French were caught in between squadrons of Allied troops in a barrage of crossfire that sank ships and killed hundreds of men. And there was no question of turning around and firing back. All they could do was continue to flee as fast as possible. Finally, though, most of the fleet did make it to La Hague. And it was there that the English, after one final battle, finally turned back. But twelve of their ships of the line had either been lost in battle or had been forced to be scuttled before even arriving there at this safe harbor. At least a dozen more were put out of commission once they arrived, some of them for good. This was a bad defeat. It was a 
serious blow to the French Navy. It was arguably a bigger blow to James II. The Navy had taken a lot of losses, but they had more ships from all around the world with which to replenish their fleet. But James would never get another chance at reclaiming his throne. The English, though, once they returned to London, were greeted as returning heroes. After all of the defeats that we've talked about today, this was a much-needed boon to Allied morale. They finally had a victory, a really big, undisputable victory to celebrate, to write about in all the papers and pamphlets, to let everyone know that their fortunes had turned around. Something to stiffen the Allied back and give them hope for the war to come. This battle would mark something of a turning point in the Nine Years' War. Not a turning point in that the tide had turned, the Allies are not going to suddenly start sweeping up French armies everywhere they go, but it marked a turning point in that here in 1692 the war was really, really going to begin to heat up. As for our story, however, those crews who were in London preparing to depart on the Spanish expedition, well, they were as happy as anyone at the news of this Allied victory. Because the French had been dealt such a defeat, such a crushing blow, they knew that for a few short weeks, a window was open for their departure to leave the Channel and head across the Atlantic. Next time, for real, we're going to talk about Henry Every, William Dampier, and the outset of the Spanish Expedition. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. Everybody who has recommended this show. And everybody who has given us a rating or a review wherever you listen to the show. You all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, most importantly, thank you for listening.